Today is a very special day for her. I know it's a day that she's never going to forgive, so we wanted to give her something uh, just to commemorate this day. And so Natalie, we want to present you with a certificate of baptism. And then your friends in Awana, all the, the leaders in Awana, they wanted to give you a Bible and they all signed it for you and wrote you some messages and so we have a Bible there. Let's give her a hand. Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. 
Bethany held a very special place in the heart of Jesus because of the special people that lived there. And so it really is no surprise that just days before Jesus would enter Jerusalem for the final time before being crucified, that we find him in Bethany. This was a sweet spot for Jesus. This was a place of love for Jesus as we're going to see. And so most of the time when Jesus was in Bethany, he was at the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. But this time we find Jesus at the home of a man named Simon the leper. Now Mark doesn't tell us the reason that Jesus is at Simon the leper's house, but John does. In writing about this very same account, John writes in John chapter 12 verse 2 that, that the reason that they were at Simon the leper's home was because a dinner was being held in Jesus' honor. Simon was the one who was giving uh, this dinner. Now, my guess is at some point during Jesus' ministry, Jesus healed Simon the leper. And I think that Simon wanted to honor Jesus for what he had done for him. Now I think it's very interesting that while Simon had lost his leprosy, and we know that Simon had lost his leprosy because if he still had his leprosy, he would not have been in his home. In fact, he would have been way off in a, in a, in a leper's colony. Because when you, when you had leprosy in that day, you were not allowed to stay around. You were forced to leave your family. You were forced to leave your occupation. You were forced to even leave the temple. You could not go and worship because leprosy was seen as unclean. And so they would, they would take all these lepers and they would put them in a colony. And so we know at some point, Simon the leper had been healed of his leprosy. He had lost his leprosy, but what I find interesting is he never lost his name. He was still known as Simon the leper. Now, I don't know why that is, but as I was studying this week, I found it very, very interesting that, that he is still called Simon the leper, even though his leprosy was gone. And again, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because he never wanted to forget the cleansing power of Jesus Christ in his life. I don't know. What I do know is that Simon threw a party to honor Jesus. What I do know is that while Jesus is reclining at a table, the woman comes up, this woman comes up to Jesus with an alabaster jar of perfume that's made out of nard. Now, I want to emphasize, it was pure nard and not pure lard. Okay? It was not a tub of lard. It was a jar of pure nard. Okay? Um, major difference. Major, major difference. Now, the nard that Mark refers to where it was an aromatic oil that was extracted from a root. And this root was found primarily in India. In other words, it was extremely rare. Now, when something is rare, it is usually what? Expensive. Expensive. Right? I mean, rare art. Very, very expensive. Um, some of you have some items that would be considered very rare. Now, most of, the, most of the time when we have something rare, it's very expensive. We know it, right? I mean, it's not something you keep out. It's something you probably keep locked away, right? You don't want it to get broken. You don't want it to get stolen. Um, if, you don't have, if you have little kids at home, right, you, you keep it far, far away, right? I mean, anymore, I'm like, the paint on our walls? I want the least expensive paint because they got handprints everywhere. I told Melissa, I said, we're not going to paint our, our home. There's no need. One day we will. But as long as we have little hands, they're just going to look good. They're just part of the decor. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so this, this perfume was extremely rare, and so it was very, very expensive. Just how expensive was this perfume. Well, a jar of this stuff, and guys, listen to this. A jar of this stuff would have cost the equivalent of a year's wages. 
or about 300 denarii. Ladies, has your husband ever bought you perfume that cost him a year's worth of wages? You guys are like, move on, Pastor, move on. Right? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having in your possession this kind of perfume? Perfume that cost a year's worth of wages. This is the kind of perfume you wore only on a special, special occasion so that it will last your entire life. I mean, it was just a little dab that you would put on. And so, you can imagine the surprise when this woman comes up to Jesus. She breaks the jar open. And she begins pouring it out on Jesus' head. Can you imagine the collective that happened in the room? And let's just be honest for a moment. I mean, if we would have been there, I mean, it's easy for us to sit here, sit here today and say, we wouldn't have gone. I think we would have. I would have. I'll tell you right now. I would have been like, you know, what is she doing? I mean, this is an expensive perfume and she's breaking it open and she's, she's pouring it out on Jesus' head. Mark 14, 3 says she broke the jar and she poured the perfume on his head. She broke and she poured. Now I want you to say that with me. She broke and she poured. She broke and she what? She poured. And so she broke and poured out all the perfume on Jesus. What an extravagant act of worship. Now, in breaking open the jar and pouring out, out the, the perfume on Jesus, this woman, you know what she was saying to Jesus? She was saying to Jesus, my life is yours. This perfume, it represents the most valuable thing I possess. In essence, it, in essence, it represents my life. And I'm pouring it all out as a love offering for you. Now, earlier I mentioned this is the kind of perfume that you wore only on special occasions. So that it will last your entire life. For this woman, this was a special occasion. It was her giving her entire life to the one who would just in a few days give his entire life for her. Now, she broke and she what? She broke and she poured. Now, for just a second I, or more, <laughs> I want to transition. I want to transition from this table moment to another table moment. Here in Mark 14, we have this table moment, but we also have a second table moment. We find Jesus once again reclining at a table. This time, it is in Jerusalem. It's in an upper room. Gathered around this table are Jesus and his 12 disciples. It will be the last supper that he shares with them before his death on the cross. Now, I want you to look what Mark writes in Mark 14, 22. So again, they're at a table. They're reclining. It's Jesus and his disciples. And Mark tells us in verse 22, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Mark continues in verses 23 and 24. Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered it to them, and they all drank from it. Now, all the germaphobes say, ooh, right? <laughs> they drank from the same cup, ladies and gentlemen. You ever been to one of those services where they did that? As soon as you saw they were doing that, you what? You walked out, some of you, right? God was watching. 
No, I've been there too. Right, and we don't do that. We have our little nice, clean, sanitized cups, right? But back then, but they were drinking, they were drinking something different. <laughs> Probably killed the germs, right? But they all drank from this same cup. And Jesus, he says to them, he says, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out. Poured out for many. Broken and what? Poured. poured. Broken and poured out. Jesus says, my body will be broken for you. My blood will be poured out for you. This bread and this wine, they represent the most valuable thing that I possess in my life. And I'm going to pour it all out on the cross as a love offering for you. Now, after Jesus finished saying this, Luke tells us. Mark doesn't tell us this, but Luke does. Luke tells us in chapter 22, verse 19, that Jesus continued with these words. He says, this is, my, this is my, my body, broken for you. This is my blood, poured out for you. And then he continues. He says, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. Do what? Well, I think Jesus was saying that we should take bread, that we should take wine. In our case, we take juice. And he was saying to us, just as he did with the disciples, remember what they symbolically represent. His body broken, his blood poured out for our salvation. In other words, Jesus is saying we should do what we call communion. We should do what we call Lord's Supper. Do this, Jesus says, in remembrance of me. And we, and we do that around here, right? Now, all scholars agree this is what Jesus was saying when he said, do this in remembrance of me. All of them agree on that. There are some scholars, however, that suggest that Jesus had more in mind. Perhaps Jesus was also saying that just as he was broken, just as he was poured out for us, that we should be broken and poured out That, in fact, one of the best ways that we can remember what he did for us is to do this ourselves. Jesus was broken and poured out once on the cross for us, and Jesus says that he wants us to be broken and poured out daily on the cross for him. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, and I, and I think the scholars who think that Jesus had something else in mind, I think they're wrong to something. I think Jesus had much more in mind than us just coming together every once in a while and, and, and partaking of, of bread and juice. But I think he's saying, I want you to live your life doing this in remembrance of me. I want you to hear what the Bible says in Luke 9, 23 and 24. This is Jesus. And he, and he says to his followers, he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross, how often? Daily. And follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but, who, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. You know, when we hold on to our life, we will never find Jesus' life. As long as what Jesus is saying here, Jesus, as long as you hold on to your life, you're never going to find my life. But when we lose our life, Jesus says we will find his life. We can never love like Jesus loves, serve like Jesus serves, and live like Jesus lives. Listen, listen, listen. Until we first die like Jesus died. If you don't hear it, anything else I say today, that is a line worth remembering. People say, I want to love like Jesus loves. I want to serve like Jesus served. But they don't want to die like Jesus. I want to tell you today, ladies and gentlemen,
gentlemen, there's no way that we'll ever find the life of Jesus. There's no way that we'll ever be able to live the life that Jesus wants us to live until we first come and die. Until we die, you know who we're living for? Self. That's who we're living for. And I want to tell you something. There's something about myself that wants to get up every day and live for itself. Anybody else like that? I mean, every day, there's something about Travis that wants to get up and he wants to live for himself. And so that is why every day, just like Jesus says, every day I have to get on the cross and I have to die. Jesus only died once, but I have to die every day. Broken and poured out. That's what Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself up. For me. Paul said, Christ lives in me. Now we want to say that, right? All of us want to be able to say, Christ lives in me. But how did Christ live in Paul? There's only one way, and that was by death. I no longer live because I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says, broken and poured out. When I dies in us, Christ lives in us. Broken and poured out. Do you want Christ to live in you? Do you really want Christ to live in you? Only one way that can happen. Every day. So that Christ can live in us. We fight that. I fight that. It's a daily battle that we fight. But the only way we're going to live the victorious Christian life, the life that God wants us to live, is to die daily to self. Broken and poured out. Now, once you hear this today, we look at Paul, I mean, we look at what God was able to do in the life of Paul and we marvel, don't we? I mean, Paul's like right up here. Do you know why Paul was able to do what Paul was able to do? Because every day, he got up and he said, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And it's amazing what you can do when Christ lives in you. I want you to hear this statement. Brokenness results in usefulness. Brokenness results in usefulness. The reason that Paul was able to be used by God is because he was broken. He was poured out. You know, we look at Paul and we say, well, Paul never, ever, ever could I live like, like that. Never. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you something today. What if the Bible was being written today? Would there be no Paul? I mean, if, if that is our mentality, that we would say that we could never live such a life, where does that leave us? Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there can be Pauls today. I believe that there's still people that God can use, but the only way that he can use people is when they're broken before him. Broken and poured out. Remember this guy by the name of Peter? He had a big mouth. I mean, he had to have a big foot. Do you remember what Peter told Jesus he would never do? Do you remember? Mark 14, 31, Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, 
I will never disown you. That's a bold statement. By a man who yet to die. He says, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Well, if you know the rest of the story, then you know Peter ends up doing exactly what he said, I will never do. Now, the reason Peter disowned Jesus is because I was still alive with Peter. But after Jesus was crucified, Peter became a different person. I want to tell you, you read it. You read it yourself. The Peter before the cross, not the same Peter as the one after the cross. Yes, amen. He was a different person. The man that deserted Jesus before the cross became a man that defended Jesus after the cross to the point of death. You want to know why he was able to do that? Because he had been crucified with Christ. I had died. Listen, when, when, when Peter was saying, I will never do this, I will never do this, I will never do this, guess what? I was still alive and well. You know what had to happen in the heart of Peter before he was able to do what he was able to do? He had to die. He had to die, and that's what, exactly what he did. You read Acts chapter 2, and you will see Peter being used by God in amazing ways. So what changed? What changed? Something had to change. I no longer lived. I no longer lived in Peter. I had been crucified with Christ. And as a result, Christ lived in Peter. Broken and poured out. And that brokenness resulted in usefulness. We need some more Pauls. We need some more Peters today. We need people who are willing to be broken and poured out because brokenness results in usefulness. And that brings us back to Bethany. I told you it'd be just a few seconds or more. When this woman begins pouring out this expensive perfume on Jesus, There were some present that began to say to one another, why this waste of perfume? Jesus says, leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing. I want you to hear something today, very important. There are those that believe when you pour out your life for Jesus that you're wasting your life. Just go and do it. I mean, try, try it sometime. Pour out your life in reckless abandon to Jesus, and you will have people look at you, and they will say, what a waste. You're just wasting your life. I mean, you might as well just live for yourself while you're here. You're wasting your life. Well, based on this story, that focus. A life poured out for Jesus is never wasted. The life that is wasted is the life that is never poured out because it is self-contained. The, the self-contained life is the most wasted life. But when you pour out your life for Jesus, I want to tell you, it's not a this story proves Jesus says there is beauty in brokenness. Jesus goes on to say about this woman that wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. That's what I'm doing today, folks. I'm talking about this lady. Here's what I get from that. A life poured out for Jesus will, will leave a lasting fragrance on this earth. Do you remember the reason Simon the leper had this dinner? Yes. 
It was to honor Jesus. The greatest way we can honor Jesus is to give him the most valuable thing any of us possess, and that is our life. And that's exactly what this woman did. She poured out her life to Jesus. So let me ask you today, do you want to honor Jesus? Do you really want to honor Jesus? And I want to encourage you to make your life a prayer through daily brokenness. Every day, go to Jesus and break open and pour out on him the most valu valuable thing that you have, your life. Say to Jesus, my life is yours. I am pouring it all out. All of it. It is all yours. And I'm pouring it all out as a love offering to you just as you poured out your life as a love offering. You know, breaking is a dangerous prayer. It's a dangerous prayer because a life broken before God is a life God can work through to honor Him in ways that will leave a lasting legacy on this earth. You know, we're all about legacies, aren't we? I mean, we all want to leave a lasting legacy, and the tragedy is many of us are giving ourselves to things that will not leave a lasting legacy. It's only when you give yourself to Jesus that that fragrance of your life will leave a lasting impression on this earth. So I just want to encourage you. Begin to say this dangerous prayer to God every day. Break it. I don't know about you, but I want the aroma of Jesus to be on my life in such a way that when I'm gone, the fragrance lingers on. That's only going to happen when I'm broken and dead. Broken and poured out is the action of love. Now, as I bring this to a conclusion, I want to go back to the host of this part of that. A man by the name of Simon the leper. In the Bible, leprosy represents sin. Remember I told you that when a person got leprosy in that day and time, they were forced to be separated from those that they loved? That's exactly where sin leaves us. Sin leaves us separated from God. Something happened in Simon's life. See, most people ran away from the lepers, but Jesus came to them. And one day, Jesus walked in to Simon's life, Simon the leper. And he touched him. And he cleansed him Amen. of his leprosy. <clears throat> and because he was cleansed of his leprosy, the man who was once separated was able to be reconciled and brought back together with those that he loved. I want to tell you, one day in my life, I, I, I was born a leper. In fact, the Bible says that all of us were born as sinners. But one day, Jesus walked into my life. And he touched me. And he cleansed me by his blood. He cleansed me of my sin. And the, the one who was once separated from God was brought back together in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something today, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus Christ came to cleanse you of your sin. If you're separated from God because of your sin, I want to tell you, Jesus is walking into your life today and he wants to touch you. He wants to cleanse you of your sin. That's what the cross is all about. There's no, there's no need to be separated from God any longer. It's been too long already. In the heart of God, it's been too long. And I'm going to tell you this much. The thought of spending eternity separated from you, that breaks the heart of God. God does not want to spend the eternity separated from you. That's the reason he walked out of heaven and walked into this earth for lepers like me and you. And so today, if you're sitting here and you know that you have never confessed Jesus as your Savior, Lord, it's a free gift. Jesus paid it all. 
The cross is all about Jesus dying for your sin. And all God wants you to do is just receive that free gift. And if you've never done that, I want to invite you during our time of invitation to make that, that decision. Simon the Leopard did. Changed his life. Changed his eternity. And God can do the same thing for you today. He wants to do that for you today. In just a few moments, Scott's going to come and he's going to sing a song. Broken and spilled out. Whatever the Holy Spirit is saying to you as a result of God's word being preached today, I want to encourage you. Begin praying. God's praying. God's praying. I want to be a life that's broken and poured out.